Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning everyone. Uh, so this lecture is about corneal tissue engineering. Uh, we are going to see why tissue engineering is necessary for corneal repair. So there are going to be two videos on this. The first one will cover about the corneal anatomy, the physiology, the tissues, the layers between the corneal layer. What is the function of the cornea and why there is a damage or why there is a necessity for repair and we should also know what are the treatment approaches that is there and why do we need a tissue engineering approach for this corneal repair. So the first video will be covering about the skin physiology, uh, corneal physiology and anatomy and the next one will cover about the tissue engineering approaches of corneal uh, repair. So taking you through the parts of the eye as the first one we have the cornea to be the first one. So the cornea is the outermost layer of the eye and this is where the light enters and the transparency is the major region, major reason or the major strength of what the corneal layer or the skin barrier is. And then we have the aqueous humor. So the aqueous humor is the fluid that is behind the cornea that provides the nourishment to the eye and then we have the iris and the pupil. So we all know what is the function of the iris and the pupil that uh, the light that passes through the cornea enters and reaches the iris and the pupil and that is where you get your vision and the dilation and the contraction helps you in seeing the near and the far distant objects. And then we have the lens that is behind the uh, pupil here this is the lens and then we have the ciliary muscles surrounding the um, uh, lens. And then we have the vitreous humor that is the transparent watery gel that supports the eye. And then we have the optic nerve that is where the nerve enters the eye and then it moves on to different ciliary nerves and enters the corneal layer that is through the sclera. Okay? So there is a connection between the cornea and the sclera and this region is called as the limbus. Okay? And this is where your nerves enter. So out of all this we are going to be studying about cornea, why a tissue engineering approach is necessary for corneal repair. So why do we need a tissue engineering for corneal repair? So the, as I have already mentioned the corneal is a avascular membrane and it gives you the uh, strength and the transparency that is necessary and it is the major region of why a refraction of the light happens and that is the reason why our vision is possible. So the corneal uh, blindness is a major cause of vision loss which is affecting over 10 million people worldwide and the options for corneal transplantation is there. So either you can take an autograft or an allograft option. So in the case of an autograft either from a, uh, the if there is one eye that is affected the tissue from the other eye which is uh, fine can also be used but the corneal layer or the corneal tissue is very extensive which we will be covering in the next few slides. So the transplantation is not as easy as it can be explained and the another thing is the corneal donors which will have you a tissue rejection which is a major criteria. So to address all these issues, to avoid this, researchers are developing new materials and strategies to repair, to regenerate or to replace the diseased cornea. So here uh, in short, the same eye that we are looking at, we have the cornea that is the tra outer transparent region which is the major refractive zone. So since it is avascular but it is innervated, okay, there are millions of nerves that goes through the cornea that is from the optic nerve when we see this red and the blue line here. So these are the nerves. So these nerves enter and through the limbus enters through the lower regions of the cornea going up to the epithelial region. So the primary function of the cornea is to transmit and to refract light and that is the reason we are able to see and visualize things. And it also protects the eye from mechanical damage, UV light and infection. 
and the corneal nerves are very important for maintaining the integrity of the ocular surface and the corneal sensation. So, let us go in detailed about the corneal anatomy and that of the physiology. So, the first one we will look about the dimensions of the cornea. So, uh, this picture A gives you the position of an anterior position of cornea and then a posterior view. So, when we see here the anterior position is elliptical in shape with a 11.7 mm here with a width and then a 10.6 mm of the uh, vertical region and then the posterior one is circular with a 11.7 mm of radius. All these is very necessary because the corneal curvature and the corneal shape is very important because when there is a repair that is either there is a bulge or a swelling or a decrease in the transparency, there is a change in these elliptical anterior and the posterior positions. So, when there is a change in your bulge, what happens is people when they use contact lenses, the contact lenses do not sit on their eye properly because the curvature of the eye changes. So, the radius of the curvature is also controlled by your corneal tissue. So, the, the anatomy of the cornea is very important and over age though there are still variations from person to person, but with disease and with wound there is a drastic difference that is associated with the corneal tissue damage. So, and then the radius of the curvature is given here. So, here we have the picture of uh, the corneal uh, radius of curvature which is around 7.8 mm and the outer uh, radius of curvature is around 11.5 5 mm that is including the sclera. The thickness is very important because uh, so the thickness is different in both the regions that is the central region of the cornea and the peripheral region of the cornea. So, the central region is around 0.52 mm whereas the peripheral region is around 0.67 mm and this region around 4 mm to 5 mm of this is the central corneal portion that is of prime importance. This is where your light enters, refracts, transmits and this region is of importance and different layers is what we will be looking at. So, any disease or any wound that we will be incurring in the corneal tissue will have a change in either their thickness, the radius of curvature or their size or shape. And uh, so, now we know that there is a differences in the curvature, radius or thickness, but we need to know what is the underlying process or what causes this to happen. So, here we have the corneal tissue layers. So, the figure here will show you an uh, image of the different layers that are being in the corneal tissues. So, the corneal tissue has previously or for a long time has been divided into five layers that is the corneal epithelium, the Bowman's membrane the central stroma, decements membrane and the endothelium. Recently in 2013, scientists have reported that there is a sixth membrane that lies between the central stroma that is here to here that is called as the pre membrane. So, it is the pre membrane. So, this membrane is between the uh, corneal stroma and the decimate membrane somewhere here uh, and now reports and scientists have already been uh, identifying because there is a lot of um, critical thinking going on in evaluating whether there is a differentiation in the membrane between the disament and the pre-disament membrane and it has found that the cells between them are different and they also have a different function associated to them. So, now uh, they are, uh, scientists are classifying that we will have six different layers in the corneal layer of epithelial, Bowman's stroma, pre-disament, disament and the corneal endothelium. And the thicknesses of these respective mediums ranges from around the corneal epithelium to be 50 to 90 microns which is a huge and the 500 micron thickness the central stroma accounts to around 70 percent of the overall region of your corneal layer. And then we have the uh, discernment membrane and then the endothelium which is a single layered cells. So, these are stratified squamous cells the corneal epithelium and then the endothelium. So, there are a vascular uh, sorry cellularized and decellularized cells. So, the corneal epithelium, the stroma and the corneal endothelium are all cellularized. Whereas, the Bowman's membrane at this are acellular or decellular membranes. 
So now we will be looking into further what is the functionality of these systems and how the repair and the regeneration process of each of these layers will affect the corneal function. So, the first one is the outermost corneal epithelium that we are looking at. So, this is a more zoomed version of only the top layer of the stratified squamous epithelial cells. So, we all know what an epithelial cell is. It is the outermost cell layer similar to how our skin cells are. These are the corneal epithelial cells that covers the outer surface. So, similar to its function, so the first thing is that it will give you the mechanical strength and then it acts as a barrier for any of the infections of my or microbes entering the cells. So, this is like the wall that is the first and the foremost region. So, and then environment allows and it also allows the uh, environment uh, oxygen and nutrient absorption into the cornea from the tear film. So, here this corneal epithelium is further divided into three different layers, the superficial cells, the wing cells and the basal cells. So, we have tight junctions within them, these cells are uh, with tight junctions to have a compact layer and the topmost, the superficial cells have a microvilli. So, this is a zoomed portion, we have a, like similar to how a compound wall has a broken horned uh, glasses or something. We have the microvilli which uh, with the glycocalyx. So, this interacts with the tear film and this is the outermost region. So, this tight microvilli and glycocalyx is very important because even when you have a corneal transplantation from a donor, only when you have these microvilli and glycocalyx will it start having the connection with the tear film and the tissue will start having the normal functions to be replaced. When this is damaged, the uh, microvilli and the glycocalyx is damaged, we need to have different cell transplant for forming these microvilli and glycocalyx to be formed. So, and then the, there are 4 to 6 layers of these cells, the superficial cells, the wing cells, the basal cells and the another important thing is the basal lamina which is the bottom most layer of these cells and desmosomes and hemidesmosomes. So, these are new terminologies. So, the desmosomes and hemidesmosomes are similar to how tight junctions are, but the hemidesmosomes help in connecting the basal cells to that of the basal lamina. So, going in detail about each of its functions and roles, first as I have already told what a tear film that is the outermost region. So, this is the tear film that is outside and this is will have a connection or will have an interaction with that of the microvilli and the glycocalyx helping it as a barrier and allowing only few things that is entering of only the oxygen and certain things into the system. And then we have the superficial cells. The superficial cells are 2 to 3 layers of glycocalyx covered with the microvilli because from these the microvilli are starting up and they prevent the tears uh, toxins from entering the eye. And then we have the wing cells. So, wing cells are polyhedral cells. So, these form the second that is the middle layer of the endothelial cells which are a connection or they have a bridge between that of the superficial cells and the basal cells. So, and then we this communicate between the superficial cells and the basal cells. Then we have the basal cells. So, the basal cells are very important. It is a major source for the wing cells and the superficial cells. So, this is the one which balances the hemostasis of that of the uh, corneal epithelial layer. And uh, so, these basal cells have tight gap connections which is connected by the desmosomes or the hemidesmosomes to that of the basal lamina. And the basal lamella, this is the one that will connect to your lower region that is your Bowman's region. So, this is not cellularized. So, this will have glycoproteins which will help in the addition to that of the Bowman's region. They have the collagen, laminin and then the glycoproteins and help in addition and then also maintains the mechanical integrity of the corneal epithelium and avoids the influx of the keratocytes from the Bowman's region to that of the uh, uh, corneal epithelial. So, now we were talking about rejuvenation. So, anything will have a wound, a repair and it is going to repair on itself. So, similarly the corneal wound or tissue damage will also have a repair on its own. The repair mechanism is known. 
So, generally uh, it will take 7 to 10 days for the regeneration process to happen, but, uh, but uh, the reason from where this is happening. So, the earlier studies told that it will happen, happen from the basal membrane that is the cells which are known to have the uh, wing cells and the superficial cells, the lowermost part of your epithelia. But further later people have understood that this is just not the source. So, we have the Bowman's membrane, the basement and this is called as your basal membrane. So, this basal membrane cells is just not the source, but there is something else that is called as a limbus region. So, this limbus which I have already mentioned is a between the cornea and that of your sclera a connection. So, this is, this is having a limbus stem cells. Okay. So, the limbal stem cells are the stem cells which migrate. So, they first have a asymptotic, asymptotic mitosis happening. So, the limbus corneal epithelial stem cells, they are called as LSCs. So, these LSCs divide to produce transiently amplifying cells. So, what happens is, so the first the stem cells, they divide into many and then they form cells. These cells then migrate, go to the Bowman's membrane and from there form the bigger layer. So, this is the principle. So, now scientists have shown that both are necessary that is the limbus stem cell region which is the major source of this uh, transiently um, amplifying cells is necessary. Their migration is an important process and then the basal cells from which the cells are stratified into the wing cells and the superficial cells. So, this theory is being explained by an XYZ hypothesis. So, this picture will tell us what is happening. So, Toft, R and Fried J, these are the two scientists who first proposed this theory of the XYZ hypothesis in 1983, which showed that there is a corneal balance between the basal cells and the limbal stem cells, which helps in the uh, maintaining of the corneal epithelial homeostasis. So, the first thing is, so please note this red color small stem cells that we are looking at. So, the uh, limbal stem cells initiated and then they migrate that is they are forming transiently amplifying stem cells which can be differentiated into any stem cells. They mitoid. So, here they migrate this is by the centripetal force migrate to the basal layer. So, this lowermost region is the basal layer and as I said the corneal layer is this. So, this is how we are looking at the eye and these are the different regions. So, we will have a wing cell here and then we have a superficial cell. So, what happens is, so first it migrates, go to this place and then after the migration, then in this step they are differentiated into the different cells, either their uh, wing cell which is the second layer or the superficial cells that is the third layer or the topmost layer and they are squamized. So, this is the entire process. So, what is this XYZ theory? So, the Z is the shedding that is when the cells are worn out okay with uh, tissue damage or by age they are they become dead cells. So, that is desquamation. So, the rate at which the cells are worn out or when the process is being damaged and then we have the centripetal migration. So, this migration is termed to be Y and then we have the cell division or the stratification that is Z sorry that is X. So, this all these three are combined that is for this to happen. So, x plus y is equal to z. So, this homeostasis is maintained by this theory that the limbal stem cells along with the basal stem cells the differentiation the mitosis process and the uh, centripetal movement all plays a role, uh, role in maintaining this process. So, this happens upon a normal tissue repair and then uh, when there is a wound that is created. So, this is what an injury happens, limbal epithelial stem cells differentiate and migrate to repair the injury. But what happens when there is a severe injury to your epithelial cell? So, when the damage to the limbus, so when there is a differences in your layers, so in your corneal layer when you have damage to any one of them, we can have the repair process happening or when there is a damage to that of your limbus systems itself. 
what will happen? In that case, a corneal transplantation will not be helpful. So, in that case, what they do is a keratoplasty is a normal term for corneal transplantation. So, when any one of these tissues are damaged, you can either take it from your own eye as an autograft taken from the other uh, eye or from an external donor that can be used for any of the corneal tissues. But when there is a damage to the limbal stem cells, a keratoplast will not work because only when these cells migrate, there will be no tissue rejection that will come as a problem. So, for this what we do is, uh, in this case there is a limbal stem cell transplant that is to be done. So, here we will have a limbal stem cell transplant or placement of the small limbal stem cell itself into the recipient place for a tissue engineer. So, for these, this is the normal approaches. So, for this we need a tissue engineering approach to have the use of the epithelial layer of mass. And now we are moving into the second layer of the epithelium that is the Bowman's layer. So, the Bowman's layer is around 8 to 14 micrometer thick and it is, uh, so this is the region that lies between that of your epithelial and that to the stroma. So, here they are not, they do not have cells, they just have proteins, glycoproteins and collagen. So, they get infused through the stromal layer. The stroma consists completely of collagen fibers. So, this is the border between that of the stroma and that of the corneal epithelium. So, here it is resistant to both mechanical and infective lesion and um, so we know that the corneal uh, region upon damage can repair on its own. Only when there is a severe damage, it cannot repair. But whereas the Bowman's, the thickness of this will decrease over age or with any wound or damage. So, this keeps decreasing. So, what happens is, the, but this will not affect your corneal epithelial layer because only above this is the entire process that is happening and the Bowman's will not have a region. But there is something else that the Bowman is responsible to that is the influx of nerve impulses. So, we have, I have already mentioned that uh, within this Bowman region is where from your optic nerve, your nerves enter the eye. So, from this the nerve enters and then gets into smaller nerves and goes up to the epithelium. So, when there is a damage to the Bowman, the eye, the corneal epithelial repair is not stopped, but there would be a problem in the nerve plexus that can have a major role to be played. So, this will have pores for the influx of nerves. So, this is the Bowman's layer and then we have the stroma. So, we have already spoken about what these layers are the corneal layer and then we have the Bowman's layer and now we move down to the major region or the major corneal um, function that is called as the stromal region. So, the stromal region is the middle layer accounts to 80 to 90 percent of its entire thickness. So, they have collagen fibers associated. So, the collagen fibers are well, uh, well uh, aggregated and they are arranged in a parallel fashion called as a lamellae with a few keratocytes. So, there are two things here primarily maintained that is the collagen and the keratocytes. So, the arrangement of the lamella is heterogeneous that is, so how a lamella is formed is these fibers are aligned in a parallel fashion in bundles and these bundles are then further oriented. So, here they form a nice good lamella and they are differentiated to the anterior position and then to the posterior position and in between them we have the keratocytes that occupy them to giving them the proper periodic arrangement and the patterning of the system. So, looking at this yellow substance is where these are the small bundles of your uh, fibers looking them at a lateral view these are the fibers of your collagen fibers as bundles arrange them and they are arranged into a specific diameter of 25 to 35 nanometer. So, what is the functions of this big stromal layer? So, the stromal layer is known for to associate the transparency of the corneal tissue. So, when whenever corneal tissue comes into your mind, the transparency is one of the major functions because that is the reason you are able to transmit and refract light and see or have a vision. So, these give you that property and then the elasticity and uh, also the strength, refractive power, the elastic modulus and the transparency. 
So the fibrils are very consistent, uh, consistently arranged as I have said and the spacing between the fibers is tightly controlled to give you a periodicity of around 67 nanometer. These numbers are very important because these numbers give you the periodic arrangement similar to how a crystal structure lattice has a periodicity in arrangement of these lattices. And then the keratocytes occupy is responsible for the synthesis and maintaining of the collagen giving you the extracellular matrix. So, this uh, transparency as I have said is the major function of what the stroma is, but why will a collagen fiber arranged in a lamella position give you a transparent membrane? What is the functionality? So, for this two people have developed their own theories. The first theory was by Morris, the known, uh, known as the Morris theory in 1957. So, the transparency of the stroma is here that he has mentioned is because of the periodic lattice arrangement. As I have mentioned, when you know the crystal lattice, the periodicity is a major role. So, when light comes and passes through, so because of the lattice uh, regularity of the arrangement, there is the suppression of the backscattered light by a destructive interference. So, there is um, the vision, there is proper refraction that is coming up and this arrangement is the one that is the reason. It is what his claim is. There, are, there is one more reason that is the interfibular distance. Uh, the interfibular distance as I have said are all cut completely arranged. The bundles will be around 25 to 35 nanometer and the fibrillar distance is around 67 nanometer. So, these numbers are less than that of the uh, incident light. So, the incident light is the light that we are seeing which is around 400 to 700 nanometer. So, whenever there is lesser than the wavelength of the light, there is going to be no interference that is being done. So, two factors are responsible. One is the arrangement and the arrangement has a specific pattern packing which is helping in responsibility for the transparency. Later, after the Morris theory in 1957, Goldman based on the diffraction theory proposed another statement that, uh, so this picture, sorry I have not explained. So, here we have a picture of the normal cornea and then we have a edematous cornea that is when there is edema, swelling or something what happens? There is a bulge in your corneal layer and your transparency is reduced. So, in the normal cornea there is a periodic arrangement that is happening whereas in this there is no periodicity that is seen. So, this shows that the periodicity plays a major role in the transparency that is bulging or the clouding of your vision. Goldman later said that the lattice arrangement is not the only requirement. He has told that the fibril layers do not interfere when the transmission of light to the transmission of light until they are larger than one third of the incident light. So, the fibrillar diameters are very small. So, similarly the transmission of light that is the light entering through is around 400 to 700 nanometer. It based on the diffraction principle he says that since the fibrillar's length dimensions are very small, they would not interfere with the transmission of light. They would interfere only when they are more than one third of the wavelength of the incident light. So, periodicity is not a matter, but the fibrillars as such will give you the transparency. These are two theories that are ongoing, but both would say that um, the stromal layer is made up of the collagen fibers and the fibril arrangement, the fibril type and the bundle packing and the lamellar packing is important in giving you the transparency, elasticity and the mechanical strength. So, what happens when there is a stromal injury or a repair? So, as we know there are two major components the keratocytes and the uh, collagen fibers. So, the keratocytes help in giving your uh, increasing the collagen source. So, when they are injured they activate and synthesize the new extracellular matrix. So, this is upon the normal injury and the repair process. Upon severe disease or injury the cell death occurs and then we have a scar tissue that is being formed which is reflected as a scarring of your cornea. So, here we have an entire keratoplasty that is to be done. So, keratoplasty as such as, as I mentioned is corneal transplantation. So, either it is penetrating keratoplasty or anterior lamella keratoplasty. So, penetrating keratoplasty is when the scar is deep. Penetrating keratoplasty means when the entire corneal region is to be changed that is is to be replaced. Uh, like the stromal region as such or the entire epithelial along with the stromal. But when we have an anterior lamellar keratoplasty, only when few of the regions are damaged, you can have a partial replacement of the 
corneal tissue. So, these are the ongoing uh, current treatment methods for the corneal transplantation. And now we move on to the pre decimate and the decimate membrane. As I have already told, the decimate is the fourth membrane, but since uh, from its inception in 2013, the pre decimate is the layer that is before the decimate membrane. So, both these membranes are acellularized membranes. So, they contain of collagens, uh, laminin, lectins, and different types of collagen. So, like before this, we will have the pre decimate membrane. And it is made up of type 1 collagen that is the pre decimate which assembles into the lamella and overall thickness is around 10 to 15 micrometer. After that we will have the decimate membrane and in this we have the type 4 collagen, laminin, nidogens, vitronectin and the fibronectin. And the basement, so this is the basement membrane of your endothelium. So, this membrane will form the basis for the endothelial cells to attach and have the tight junctions. So, and this membrane can regenerate and is resistant to chemical agents and infections. So, we have looked about decement and bowmans, both are acellularized membrane. This will have, this cannot regenerate whereas a decement membrane can regenerate and they are resistant to chemical agents, infections and pathology. And the other difference is over age the Bowman's membrane reduces in thickness whereas the decimate membranes increases in its thickness over the age. And then we have the endothelium. So, the corneal endothelium is the bottom most cells that we are looking at. So, this is the layer, it is a single layer, 1 to 2 layers of cell thickness is what forms your corneal endothelium, the innermost cells of the corneal tissue. And it is a simple squamous cell layer and the cell density is a major role. So, the cell density of these uh, endothelial cells decreases over age. Say for example, this, this picture will tell you that. So, a newborn baby would have around 3000 to 4000 cells per millimeter cube squared. Whereas, as we all grow, the adult would have a 2500 uh, centimeter square whereas here with age it further reduces to 2000 cells per meter square. So, what happens when these cells are reducing in number they are we are going to have gaps in between them. So, to occupy that space what happens is there is an increase in the size and shape. So, compensated by increase in cell size and cell shape that is polymegathism and poly pleomorphism. So, this is what it is. So, in early life it is 80 to 20 micron over age it becomes 40 or more. This is the characteristic of what an endothelial cells is. So, we all know what since as we know an epithelial cells will have act as a barrier, the endothelial cells will perform the major functions for the cells. So, they will be metabolically very active for the passage of the flows. So, similar in that the corneal endothelium is also like that. So, it is metabolically active, it has a mitochondria, but it is mitotically inactive. So, that is the reason they will not regenerate. Once it is formed, it just degenerates over age, but it is not going to be replenished. And uh, so, the major functions are they are metabolically active. So, they control the sources that is the nutrient inflow and outflow from the cells within the layers, what goes into the stroma and what is being pumped out of the stroma. And the stroma is an hydrated layer. So, why it gives you a transparency, it also has a hydrated layer. So, this endothelium is acting as the pump. It has the efflex pumps pumping out the excess water and the fluids outside maintaining the osmotic pressure. So, it maintains the osmotic pressure and then the bicarbonate ions. So, it acts as the pump and then translegulates the water content to the system. So, this is another uh, picture showing how over age your uh, endothelial cells size and shape changes. With 20 years over 40 years the shapes are increasing though the cell number that is density is decreasing to occupy those spaces we have the size to be bigger. So, here if it is this. So, over age we have found them to be bigger in cell size and shape. So, what happens when there is an injury to this layer? So, arrested of the G1 phase that is the reason. So, they have a G1 phase which is arrested. So, they are mitotically not active. So, they would not have cell division. And uh, so, with age and with any repair they are going to reduce in cell size uh, sorry cell number. 
So, these are the thickness of the basement membrane and the endothelial cell density decreases. But when there is a severe density decrease that is less than 500 cells per mm, that time the endothelial cells will not be able to function that is they will not be able to pump out the excess fluid from the stroma. So, which will lead to a swelling of the corneal layer there will be a swelling or a bulging of the layer the transparency would be minimized and there would be a cloudy appearance therefore distorting your vision. And so for this this is the region when there is a basement membrane issue that is when there is a problem in your endothelial cells your entire corneal cells will be affected and it has to be replaced a corneal transplantation would be done. So viable stromal and epithelial tissues and endothelial keratoplasty or this endothelial keratoplasty will be done and the transplantation with minimal rejection can be performed only a endothelial cell layer can be transplanted if there is no damage to that of the other uh, superficial layers. And uh, what is the blood supply? So, the cornea is an avascular structure and uh, so here we have the optic nerve. So, the ophthalmic artery is here. So, this has got from its blood vessels from the carotid artery. So, from here it enters. So, the cornea is the one of the tissues which is avascular. So, it will not have any blood vessels within the corneal region. So, but only at its outermost junction it would have few ciliary vessels. The anterior ciliary vessels invade at its periphery not towards the center of the corneal regions. So, the loops here what happens is the ophthalmic artery comes and it enters through the uh, along with the optic nerve and then branches out the central retinal artery and the uh, short posterior ciliary arteries. From these posterior arteries and these arteries we are going into the lacrimal artery or the tear gland. Within them only towards the sides we are having a small touch through the posterior edges we will have the blood supply that is reaching through the cornea that is only at the subconjunctivital tissue. And the nerve supply, we have already mentioned where is the region at which there is a nerve supply that is happening. So, the cornea is an highly innervated tissue. So, it has a lot of nerves in the corneal tissue and the nerves enter through the Bowman's membrane. So, the ciliary nerves from the ophthalmic division enters through this. So, here we have the ciliary ganglion. So, first from this ganglion we have a ciliary nerves that are all coming off and this channel before this we have this channel going in up to that of the cornea. So, long posterior ciliary nerve and the short posterior ciliary nerve. So, if this is the case we have the Bowman's membrane. So, on a clearer picture this is our entire stromal structure we have the stroma below this we have the basement membranes. So, the endothelial and the disseminate membrane do not have nerves and then we have only the stroma coming in and uh, here we will have the nerves going inside them and from the Bowman's layer the nerves are being uh, made further down. So, they are further branched and then go up through the different layers that is the basal cells, the nensens, uh, wing cells and then the superficial cells up to that of the sensory nerve fibers that go through the topmost corneal epithelial. So, this Bowman's layer will is a major region of your nerve plexus. So, this will have pores for the nerves to enter and this gives you the nerves for the entire epithelial uh, region of the corneal. So, below this the stromal part, stromal has just the uh, nerve entering and below this that is the disseminate membrane and the endothelium do not have nerves. So, what happens when there is a corneal tissue damage? So, a cornea, uh, so we have now studied that uh, there are different sections of the cornea and uh, different layers and regions each has its own tissue uh, repair uh, damage that is whenever there is a wound or a damage there is a repair system that happens only in severe cases when there is a complete damage it cannot repair on its own. So, that is the time when there is an uh, intervention by all these corneal transplantations that is to be done. So, what happens? What, how do we see when there is an underlying phenomena that is happening? So, the first thing is a blurry vision, a cloudiness because your transparency is lost. So, you are not able to see bulging all this would happen. So, there are three major conditions of the cornea 
that is uh, commonly studied is the keratococcus the bullous keratopathy fox endothelial dystrophy so this is the picture of a normal corneal structure when there is a keratococcus what happens is there is a bulge so it protrudes out the cornea protrudes out and there is a bulge so that the concavity the anterior and the posterior elliptical position is changed we and uh, so this so this can also be seen when there are people who use contact lenses the contact lenses will not be in position so this is a disease is called as a keratococcus and then we have the bullous keratopathy where we, the, you have blisters like swelling onto your corneal outer layer that is happen that is the bullous keratopathy and then we have the fox endothelial dystrophy or the corneal scarring which is a progressive disease where the corneal endothelium is damaged that is as i've said the bottom most endothelial cells are being damaged so the cornea develops swelling causing it to become cloudy and the, there is a vision delay or vision loss so this happens when that the endothelial cells are being destroyed so for these what are the treatment options so the current treatment options tells you the full penetrating keratoplasty so the entire donor cornea is transplanted to the recipient cornea and then we have the endothelial keratoplasty so in the endothelial keratoplasty we have a few layers that is similar to what anterior lamellar keratoplasty is when there is an endothelial keratoplasty only the endothelial corneal tissue is being replaced when there is an anterior lamellar keratoplasty only a stromal region so knowing the names you will be able to see which region of the cornea is being damaged and what needs to be repaired or what needs to have a transplantation so whichever regions from your stroma to your epithelium to the endothelium if there is a minimal change or very few layers that are being damaged those layer can be transplanted and then it will uh, taken up by your host system and will have a minimal rejection but if there is an entire damage then a new corneal transplantation has to be done which is called as a full penetrating keratoplasty and uh, why is this a difficulty so the first is the donor corneas are limited worldwide with only 130000 donated annually and uh, so the problem with the cornea donors is that tissue uh, rejection so which is a very common with any skin tissue donation uh, the corneal tissue donation also has this problem so to overcome these we would have to have other uh, tissue engineering approaches worldwide so that the minimize uh, minimal levels of tissue donors can be used and we will have a better uh, regeneration repair for these systems of the different layers so we have studied that there are different layers and each layer has a very own significant of its own so taking into consideration the stroma which gives you the transparency epithelium which will give you the mechanical barrier the endothelium which will give you a metabolically active state so these all have cells of different kinds and tissues of different uh, layers are being formed which has a different function and structure so based on that if tissue engineering approaches are used in the form of scaffolds cells or by uh, stem cells that is the limbal stem cells or uh, corneal stem cells that can be grown outside and then be infused again if these are all done then the um, avoiding of uh, corneal transplantations can be done but tissue engineering approaches can be overcome thank you